Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome. I'm Rosa Lazardi, the Global Director of the Feminist Task Force. And on behalf of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development, I want to welcome you to our webinar today, Capital versus Life, Corporate Capture, Financialization, and Financial Extractivism. This webinar is a series of dialogues entitled Macro Solutions for Women, the People, and the Planet, which we are presenting to delve into the systemic dynamics that have undermined the well being of women, their families, their communities, and overall humanity and the planet. We began this series covering the financial impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, which continues to affect the challenges faced today. Through these webinars, we are taking a deeper dive into the gendered impacts of these thematic issues, and feminists, activists, and experts are painting a fuller picture and analysis with regard to trade, tax, debt, intellectual property rights, the climate emergency, a Green New Deal, and how the care economy impacts women and girls, where the burden disproportionately falls on their shoulders. It has become clear that we need to search for systemic solutions, addressing the root causes of the current challenges. Furthermore, now more than ever, we need to map what are the main messages and actions we can promote within and across social movements for impact, impactful solutions. Each webinar has aimed to present the structural points of entry of a specific macro issue. And today's is on the financialization and financial extractivism of capital and human resources. And we're looking at the interconnectedness to women and girls' human rights, as well as to the environmental impacts on people in the planet. So without further delay, I want to introduce my partner and co-convener of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development, Emilia Reyes from Equidad de Genero, we welcome all the panelists and we thank you for joining us today. Emilia, I hand over to you. We have a stellar panel. Um, it's going to be a wonderful webinar. Hello, everybody. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here uh, today in this webinar. I am going to be your moderator. And we are very thrilled to have the fantastic lineup that we are having today. And uh, I just uh, cannot say how privileged we are in having the minds and the opinions and the inspiration of all of these amazing and fantastic women. So looking forward as well to share our, our reflections and uh, perhaps also to strategize a bit on what are the current challenges regarding financialization of development and financial extraction. So uh, without further ado, I'm inviting uh, Saskia Sassen to join us. She will be our first speaker. I just uh, want to uh, share with all of you, the audience, that Saskia uh, has um, an emergency, so she will have to leave uh, early. So what we will, uh, we are inviting all of you to, to share your questions or comments in the chat. And what we will do in just in this occasion, Saskia will deliver her presentation. And after that, uh, we will be open for some Q&A before she has to, to um, leave this, this webinar. So um, feel free to start and jump in into, into engaging with, with this amazing uh, researcher and scholar and activist. I'm just going to do the proper uh, introduction. Saskia Sassen is the Robert S. Lind Professor of Sociology and member of the Committee on Global Thought, Columbia University. She has uh, many uh, publications. Her recent books are with uh, Mary Caldor, Cities at War, and um, cities in a world economy and expulsions, brutal and complicit, 
brutality and complexity in the global economy. She's a recipient of diverse awards, including multiple Dr. Honoris Causa, the Principe de Asturias Prize in the Social Sciences. She was made a foreign member of the Royal Academy of the Sciences of Netherlands, and most recently was awarded the Geneva Picciotto Prize. Her new research projects is an ethics of the city. So we are definitely thrilled to have you here, Saskia. I'm just gonna ask um, if you can open up the, the conversation addressing why are we talking about financialization of development or why, why are we talking about uh, extractive, financial extractivism and feel free to enlighten us with your knowledge and your experience. Welcome very much. Oh, well, it's a great pleasure. Can you hear me? Yes, can you, you can hear me? Hear me? Okay, very, very good. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be part of this wonderful event. You know, this doesn't happen too often that you have this mix of women addressing major issues. There are far too many conferences where there are too many men, so to speak. Um, so let me let me just focus on a few items, and I'm talking about the negatives that we are confronting, the negatives which are often dressed in the clothing of brilliant minds, reasonable options, etc., but which in the end, when you track them and trace them, you realize that at the end, what you have is an extraction not a giving, not an opening, but something is extracted. And, and so that leads me to this notion that we're living with the rise of extractive logics. Now we have always had inequalities. That's sort of part of how this capitalism functions. But there are inequalities and inequalities. What is happening today is a mode of extracting from not just the poor, not just the modest middle classes, but now also the not so poor middle classes. And ironically, that becomes a kind of wake up call because those middle classes have voice, a kind of voice that the poorer segments do not have. Now, why is this happening? If you look even 20 years ago, what I'm going to describe to you was not happening. So here's what's happening now. You take a high-rise building made for low-income workers. Uh, you know, always a bit dodgy, not the highest this, not the highest that. Today, one of the leading financiers, I mean leading financiers in the world, has been buying in 17 countries these high-rise towers that are for low, built for low-income people. And you ask yourself, why? Why are they bothering? They who are so rich, I'm talking about one of the richest, richest firms in the world. Why are they doing this? Why are they interested in very, in, you know, in high-rise buildings that are very modest buildings and that are for the poor? Well, it turns out that when you bring into the picture the question of high finance, which is a term that probably most of you understand, but it's a kind of capability that is truly abstract that, and very, very open. It's basically algorithmic mathematics. Algorithmic mathematics is an open system. This open system can incorporate bring in more and more elements. This is new. And this is especially new vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the housing question. I mean, that type of firm can actually extract value from a lot of high-rise, very modest housing, which 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, they wouldn't even have considered doing. Now, that's the one side of it. The other side is, who are the losers here? And the losers often are low-income people who would rather have a, a, a building, let's say, that is not perfect, but that is their building. And they have fought for that across 
decades in all our major cities. And now, and they won, they won, they, they had some resources. And now they're also losing that. And that is a serious issue. So for me, this, this, um, this modus operandi that is emerging with many big firms, I call it a kind of financial extractivism. And I want to emphasize this term extractivism, which really is a very powerful term. I think especially in today's epoch, it captures something. And what it captures is the growing capacities of many, many actors in play. Some who are, you know, they're sort of honest. It's not that they're devious, they're honest. But extraction has become a modus operandi that means that you take, you take, you take. You do not give. There was a time when the builders of housing, whether public or private housing, actually cared about how they built the houses, they cared about the people, they cared about their neighborhoods. That is simply out in more and more major cities, I'm especially thinking about major cities. And so the final point, I don't want to talk too, lot, too much here, the final point is that it behooves us, it's good for us, that we recognize, we, your average, you know, citizen or, or resident in a city, actually, we can understand those complex logics. We may not be able to execute, to work with those logics, but we can get the picture. And so my call is a call for men and women, and including children who are not too young, you know, because otherwise it's impossible, um, to actually think, you know what? I can understand high finance. I can understand this type of high finance because what marks this type, the current period type of high finance is about extracting, taking it away, taking it away, and even a modest, a big broken down building for low income housing can serve the purpose. Why? Because it's not about the building. It's about the assets that are involved in a building. There are materialities, there are, and, and it goes from the actual building into the financial circuit where you don't see the building. What you see is assets, material stuff that can be bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold and can be invested in. So it sounds difficult to understand. There is a kind of intermediate disappearance of the real, of the building, because the building becomes a field of assets. But I want to invite you and to say just what I said now. You know, if you understand that language that I spoke, you understand what is happening. And that is that a building is a building, but it's also something else when taken in by an investor. That investor transforms that building into a field of materialities. And we now know, for instance, in New York, in London, an empty luxury tower is actually better than an inhabitant because you can be free to continuously use the elements that that luxury building is and invest it in all kinds of things, play the markets, etc. You don't need people. Now, this is still rare, but it is existing in Milano, in New York, in London and a few other places. So that means that we, the citizens, have now a double difficulty. I don't expect most of us to be able to fight that fight. We don't have time, we have children, we have et cetera, et cetera. But it's important to be aware when you are engaged with your building to keep that kind of owner out. I think there is today in major cities a battle of this kind. And, and again, for those of you who want to learn a bit more about it, just contact me. I'm in the, I'm in the Columbia University uh, 
list and, and you can find me easily. Uh, I hope I hope I contributed something to it. I know that my time is up. Thank you very much. And if there are some questions, I would love to hear them. Thank you so much, uh, Saskia. While well, we are looking for the questions and comments of the audience, um, I'm going to ask you something because I read an interview of yours and you were um, sharing a very striking example about an interview you did with uh, metal uh, constructors. Um, they were truckers and they were driving around uh, sheets of yeah. metal all around the, the country because Goldman Sachs was deliber deliberately delaying the delivery. So creating scarcity uh, of construction and therefore profiting for us. Could you could you go uh, deeper into into that notion of? I think that reflects very well the notion of, of uh, extraction and how there is no benefit for the people. It's all about how the the, the profiting of, of these uh, financial entities. Yeah, yeah. This is an amazing story, uh, and, and it ended with Goldman Sachs being taken to court. Huh? So the the data are out there for those of you who really are interested. Am I speaking too loud, or is this fine? No, it's perfect. Okay, fine. So here's what happened, and and we sort of hit on it a bit by chance. Here are these vast trucks, and they are carrying huge slices of woods and things like that. And they, they, we, I ran, we ran into that a bit by chance. And they say, oh, yeah, we have to move all of this again today. We have to move it somewhere else. Well, it turns out that these were, yes, wooden materials that Goldman Sachs had bought in enormous quantities. And that in order to raise the price on the financial markets of wood, because wood is a very valuable uh, input into all kinds of uh, um, situations, uh, they were delaying delivery. By delaying delivery, they could say, oh, oh there's a bit of a crisis here with wood, so uh, it's going to have to be more expensive. And the drivers were telling us, you know, they're just driving around to moving the stuff from one to another and then back to the original, etc., etc. Now, in that case, Goldman Sachs was taken to court and had to pay a fine of billions. For them, that was actually not such a huge mm -hmm. amount of money. For us, it would be sort of devastating, you know, almost beyond our imagination, so to say, of what money is. But that just gives you an example of the extreme. And what does Goldman Sachs do? The one thing they wanted to do was to avoid going to court because then there would be a record of this sort of lie, you know, this sort of abuse. And so they were willing to pay a huge fine. I mean, huge. We're talking billions, which for them is not that much. And so they got out clean. Now, it came out in it's one of the few times that something like this really came out into the news. And it but for most people, it was almost unreal. They couldn't imagine that Goldman Sachs was driving around these huge pieces of, wall, of, of wood in huge trucks, just from one place to the other, regularly moving them, in order to what? To raise the price on the financial markets. I mean, it, you know, that's just one example. There is no time to elaborate on some of the others. This is a very straightforward, simple to understand example. So it, it makes, it invites us to ask, well, my God, what all else are other major firms that operate globally doing? I mean, they must think that we, your average citizen, is a kind of fool, you know, that they can fool over and over. So, you know, it's, it's quite a story. I must say, I recommend it. It's, it's in the news. It came out in the papers, I mean, yeah. a few years ago. So, so you can check it out. It's extraordinary. We actually have a, a question that is relating to this. I mean, who would be uh, those intermediaries or financial entities who are investing in housing? That is one question. And the other is, uh, can financial regulation help in reducing, although obviously not stopping financialization? And well, if yes, 
I didn't say what you the last one you just said was what? Yes, if can, can financial regulation help in reducing financialization? Uh -huh. And yes, which forms of regulations are the most effective in your opinion? Uh huh. Okay, that's a tough one. What forms of regulation are the best? You say right? Yeah. Okay. Number one, um, yes, we could do much more. To govern, and I'm talking about governing. This is not controlling. This is governance, just basic governance. You know, is one way of putting it. I would like to send them all to jail, but that's not going to help us. So <laughs> we move back to a sort of a, a more considered language. So, so number two. In order to join the battle, so to say, and we did a film. You know, the film is called Push. Push as in push out, push people out. And then, you know, uh, but I recommend the film is fantastic. And uh, she, she was a person in charge of housing for the United Nations, brilliant woman, a lawyer. And she made the most of, you know, we have these positions that appear regularly huh, that, that are temporary positions. But she did a really fantastic job. So I was part of her team when we were examining all of these, these housing issues. Um, now, the question with housing, again, is, is that the capacity of the financial system to reduce it to assets, that is the challenge. And that is where we, your average person, loses ground, loses the capacity to intervene. I don't know if I explain myself, you know, because because we don't have the capacity to fight on the financial markets. And so once they have the house, they transform it. And, and the visual that I, that I like always to leave you with is a field of materialities. It could be a wall, a toilet, a kitchen, it doesn't matter. They're materialities. And via this high financial capability, uh, you can actually transform it into assets. And the assets are there. The assets mean there is a kind of materiality there. Eh? But it, of course, it has the house is still standing, you know. But you might get a door, you might get, you know, that is one image that I like to use. I don't know if that helps, but. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you well, have a lot of. Have a lot of Again, in uh, from the audience on the name of the firms we mentioned earlier on purchasing high rises in the seventeen country. I didn't understand what you said. Sort of got lost a bit. Say it again. Yeah, I, I can't hear. I'm gonna try to try to be more clear. Yeah. Um. Could you share the name? of the firms uh, you mentioned earlier on purchase, purchasing high rises in the 17 countries, or perhaps you can share links to, to this case. And uh, more questions from the audience about, uh, about the deregulation uh, processes that we are seeing nowadays. Do you think that um, the freedom to be extractive is exacerbated by this uh, trend to deregulate? and uh, in the law procurement uh, processes. Uh, yeah. Those okay. Are questions. Yeah, these are excellent questions. They are, they are also complex conditions. Huh? So uh, uh, if you're really interested, you would have to go to some of these articles in order to read it. But basically what we're talking about is via algorithmic math mathematics, you can actually transform uh, a whole set of very, very diverse elements into a kind of common element, which is uh, an asset. That's a very abstract concept, I know that. But that is an extraordinary capability you know, that, that, uh, that these big financial firms have. Um, we see it happening in more and more countries, which is very problematic. So it has entered Africa. Uh, it has, you know, it is certainly present in, in the United States, in Brazil, in, in, the, in the Americas. And it's very difficult for us, the average citizens, 
to point a finger and to say, you know, the famous French image, j'accuse, you are guilty, because it just doesn't work that way. So that's one element. Number two, the law should be changed. The law should be far more on top of all these, what we can think of as abuses of power by firms such as the Goldman Sachs firm. We all know about that name, right? Uh, we simply lack law because these firms are number one, dealing with a whole new world, you know, where abstraction is, is the ultimate tool. And once you make something very abstract, you can say, oh, but that's a dirty blah, blah. No, you can't. It becomes a very abstract. That is the ultimate protection for these types of firms. That, and, they, and they pride themselves on their algorithmic mathematics. They have mostly where before you had uh, women sitting at long, you know, hundreds of women doing all the typing, etc. Now you have um, experts of all sorts uh, sitting there. So, so you know, and the experts themselves, uh, they dealing with this algorithmic math, you know, they are not necessarily directly guilty. This is their job. And they don't make the most money. The ones who make the most money are the, are the financial owners of the firm. So, so it is a very elusive kind of combination of elements. It makes it really difficult to simply say, I accuse you, you are guilty. And, and one way that, uh, one kind of concept that I like to use is this notion of the rise of intermediation. So it's neither here nor there. The intermediary may start the, the connection between two separate firms, but the intermediary never loses. The ones who decide to make the the you know to to join forces or to buy from such about they might lose but the intermediaries don't lose and so you have these firms like goldman sachs who are so wealthy i mean you wouldn't believe it how wealthy they are that doesn't mean that all the wealth expresses itself in fancy housing no it means much more than that it is a it's a capability <laughs> that that allows you to go and grab so to say take out from all kinds of countries across the world you know, it, it's just, it, it is a kind of inequality that goes way beyond the way we have thought of this concept of inequality. And, and um, it's serious. It, it really is serious. I would be very happy to send to you uh, later, I don't have it handy now, to send to you the info for the film. film. And the film is called Push, and it has won many, many awards. And it really helps you understand. And it looks at very material conditions. I'm the most abstract speaker in that film. I speak in that film like I speak with you now. But the film mostly is about, you know, how big enterprises, especially, you know, some very famous firms that are into grabbing housing in order to make money off it, not in order to provide residences to people, really. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or. Yes, thank you. I mean, uh, we we will move on to uh, our other speakers, but we are very grateful for uh, you laying the ground for thinking about this uh, intermediary space. Like, as you say, it's kind of abstract, but it's really, uh, it has materialized in, in our spaces, in our cities, and uh, evidently in, in transforming this and shaping the, the multiple inequalities. Um, uh, we have shared a link of an interview with you and okay. your contact information. And um, we are very happy to, to start this conversation because this webinar is yeah. for activists to start thinking about future steps. So we look forward to engaging in a, in a final webinar in a couple of months in coming up with, with actions and solutions. So we look forward Absolutely. to, to yes, seeing you there Yes, this is great, really well. great. I love it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. You're most welcome to stay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we have uh, plenty of, of comments uh, and um, questions about um, 
perhaps knowing um, the name of the owners of the companies or who's the beneficial owners of company assets can also help us uh, challenge the, the current um, the current uh, concentration of wealth provided um, promoting by these um, entities. I'm just going to open the floor now for uh, Miriam van der Stichel, our next uh, speaker, who's a senior researcher at the Amsterdam-based SOMO, the nonprofit center for research on multinational corporations, and associate as well of the Transnational Institute. Uh, Miriam has researched and advocated from a sustainability and civil society perspective on different, har different harmful aspects of the financial industry. And uh, given the importance of the political economy of finance, she has also monitored EU and international financial reforms and financial services liberalization in trade and investment agreements to support civil society in their advocacy. She has also previously researched and coordinated NGO work on trade and food value chains. And perhaps she can also help us uh, digging into the linkages with human rights and gender equality and also the environmental impacts. Um, Miriam, I cannot uh, emphasize enough how privileged we are of having you here in this webinar. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you all hear me. Yes, right. Um, so I hope uh, my my uh, PowerPoint is going to be shared as well. And basically, I think I will really kind of elaborate of what has been said and give some more examples of what uh, Saskia had been saying, but also to show how that is affecting our um, um, kind of our daily lives and also from a gender perspective. Can we share the screen or do I just don't see it? I don't know what is happening. Anybody? Anyway, so basically what I would like to do is to um, kind of, there are different ways how to tackle this extravism and how to kind of um, get the message out, you know, what needs to be done. And the first one is to share um, the discourse. Um, and that's something that I want to, to deal with and to kind of change, to, to start with, but also um, to show some examples of how extractivism is at work and um, why it is, uh, the next slide please, um, you know, why it is important for us to understand a bit more in detail what actually Saskia was saying, because basically what she was referring to was to investment funds, which are called uh, real estate investment funds, and the, which as an intermediary have uh, Blackstone. So we need to, I think, also to name some companies at some point. Um, but the second example I want to give is what is happening with developing country debt also being part of this extractivism uh, system that uh, um, is a, in fact a bit the same as what Saskia was saying. So I will also try to come up with kind of some dis, um, solutions as a discussion points for later in our um, in the later in the seminar. Next slide, please. So when I'm saying we have to change the discourse, is that because very much we we call it investment and we want to have input of money, private money, um, but actually we really have to kind of really get the message across, it's actually going to extract much more money that isn't going in. So we also see in the finance for development, in all kind of also with COVID, you know, we need the private sector also for the climate change. We need the client, we need the private sector to come in, but actually it's the financial sector that is the problem. They were extracting all those value that doesn't go to um, just transition uh, to the workers, etc. And that's because of there was such a hu huge uh, regulatory capture. That means so much lobbying by the financial industry that we don't have regulations um, so that basically they there was a lot of money that goes into um, a, a few hands while the rest is not benefiting from it. And now we have to plea the financial private financial sector please can you give some money and then they're saying well we want to do it only when you provide blended finance being you know you give some guarantees but actually the guarantees is that they can extract the, val the financial value 
and the governments and just the taxpayers are um, getting the, the risks. So it's extremely important that we kind of get this in mind. Just to give you an example is how much money has gone um, to the financial sector, the different figures, and I will come up with a few other ones. But the biggest bank, for instance, JP Morgan Chase, and its profit last year was $36 billion, just as an intermediary. Yeah, just to give you a bit of a sense of the um, the um, of the values that are going on there. Um, and um, next uh, next slide, please. So I think when you look at the um, structural problems behind it, there are many of them. I just want to mention a few here in the beginning, and we will come up uh, with some others later. But First of all, yes, there are very few women in the top decision making, as much as in Wall Street. We have a, a first woman now, but you know, that doesn't mean kind of what it really, if there will be really any change, but also in ministers of finance. It's very much an old uh, boys network within the financial sector. Yes, there's a lot of sexism. There are lots of examples of it, even the Financial Times writing about it. But for me, what is really striking is this lack of responsibility. There's, I mean, when we're now looking at uh, more what is called environmental and social impact assessments, they have no clue what their impact is on social issues, on gender, let alone gender, on environment. They just don't know. They have no figures. Their instruments are not there. And if they do so, because there's no ESG rating, it's environmental social governance rating, it's really still not what it is, not really looking at what the impact is. So this kind of lack of responsibility I find extremely striking and very worrying. Um, and of course, it's still having a, the, the whole financial sector is very having a masculine culture, you know, conquering markets, penetrating markets, risk taking, fierce competition uh, to get high profits, uh, eat or you you merge or you are being merged um, and basically getting a high status of power through being rich. So this is kind of different elements in the financial sector that are playing together and that we are standing with where, you know, kind of leading to this extractive structure of the current uh, financial system. I've been working especially on the private sector. Um, so that's where I want to give you some um, examples and the most um, two examples. The first one, next slide, please. Of course, the first um, typical example is the priority given to shareholder value. I mean, as you know, and probably it's not known again, but Corporations are being accused of being especially focused on on, uh, on profit taking, but the reason why they do it is because they are under huge pressure from their shareholders, um, and to please their shareholders, they have already been giving a huge amount of dividends and. Um, the SP 500 corporates, that's the 500 biggest US corporations, they have been giving almost a trillion of dividends in two years, 2018-19, and 1.5 trillion in share buybacks. So they're just buying the, the shares back to please the shareholders. And who are the shareholders? The shareholders are uh, the investment funds, um, the, uh, the, the the Goldman Sachs who done our kind of intermediary as as intermediaries, um, and basically what you see they continue to pay out um, and increase these um, share values if you want. But what is happening is that it means that this this money is not spent on workers. It's not spent on consumers throughout the value chain. You know from from the and uh, the kind of the extraction of um, minerals up to kind of retail and what consumers are getting. And of course, because of this pressure of extracting as much profit as possible, there's a huge pressure to exploit the weakest values in the in the chain. That's workers, but also very much women um, who have no power, uh, no insight of, you know, where the pressure comes from and to put pressure uh, to kind of to have, they basically lost it, their bargaining power because of the concentration. So, but also there's no investment in just transition. I mean, we will talk about climate change later by some other speakers. So, um, so this constant um, 
pressure for social environmental exploitation is is also what you know at the end of the chain that's very much what women are feeling in different kind of different kind of ways you know because these companies are in different sectors in which um women are involved or have um are feeling the consequences of so next slide please so i think the best visual that you can see is when you see the 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 uh, graph going up is basically the value of the shares going up um, and the graph underneath in red is the, for instance, the wages. Just to give an example of, you know, where the difference are. So the profits goes to these richest shareholders. For instance, you know, Bezos is now the richest man because he still has a lot of the shares. But the huge amount of the shares are in the investment fund industry. You know, the Black Rocks who are putting all different shares, uh, amount of shares from different companies in one fund and another fund and another, and another. I mean, millions of funds. Uh, BlackRock is managing 7 trillion, part of it on in investment funds, and also the share trading industry. So it's kind of the ones who are making profit out of it is the ones who are giving advice, analysts, the the stock exchanges, um, they provide uh, the the ones who are really kind of speculating, the hedge funds uh, through high frequency trading and so on. They are the ones who are really benefiting and extracting huge amount of it. And don't forget I'll, that also there will be new, it's not only the shares, but also the industry is also dealing with the bonds from these corporations. So when the corporations try and get some money, not only loans, but also through bonds, again, this is being integrated in the in the fund industry. And of course, the more kind of interest rate, um, the higher the interest rate, the more they're interested. But the losers are the workers who don't have the power to say, well, if you have making so much profit, part of it belongs to us. Um, Women do, who don't normally, I mean, kind of generally have less assets, they're not able to invest. So those who have capital, they just can put it in those in financial system and, you know, they get more returns. But those who don't have assets and women are part of it, of course, not everybody, also others, they don't, they're not at all profiting. So that's why this inequality is in rising and rising. Climate and environment, because uh, there's still no kind of way to stop um, exploitation of environmental resources. And of course, the taxpayers are all also going to lose. The best way to understand what is happening now in COVID-19, governments have to come in because a lot of people and companies, uh, small companies, uh, can't survive. Why? Because they haven't got kind of real, their due income that they should have had during uh, the, the period before when these high profits were being made. But now the shareholders are not uh, are not obliged to pay back on the contrary there will be more bonds that will be issued by the uh, by the governments to kind of cover the costs of paying you know the workers and the small companies who were exploited also by the big guys um and those bonds who is going to to buy them exactly against the financial sector and the fund industry and they again will be able to profit so it's kind of, they're benefiting twice for the moment in COVID-19. So this bailout really has to be, um, let us say, has to be announced as as being a system, a financial system, which is facilitating it. it um. So the second example, next slide, please, I wanted to give as a very concrete example of what is happening is in developing country debt. Um, I think quite some of you know that um, developing countries were really highly indebted. And of course, because of COVID-19, it's getting much, much worse. But why were they so much indebted? Um, one third was, was uh, through uh, private, um, private markets, private uh, bondholders from developing countries. Why? Because there was a lot of investment banks who went to developing countries, first emerging markets, emerging markets, and then they wanted to have more and more ways to get uh, these bonds. And they call them frontier market bonds. So the frontier market countries are like Senegal, Ecuador, Zambia, you know, kind of really poor countries in Ghana. Um, and they were kind of saying to those countries, you know, you don't need this kind of loans from the World Bank IMF because there are conditions. So if you issue them on the market, there are a lot of um, investors who are interested in it. So they were issuing those bonds with huge amount of fees. You know, they, the, the, the ministries of finance of these countries had to be 
paying high, high fees to these investment banks who were issuing it. And, you know, they were organizing roadshows. I just kind of like this uh, terminology, how investors had to be seduced. And they were because the interest rates are extremely high. Just some examples. Ghana is providing for 31 years, 8,9% per year on a 1 billion bond. Ecuador is paying 10.75% per year. Angola is paying up to 2018 9.3% about 9.4 percent of interest rate so of course these kind of bondholders are interested but these bondholders are mostly asset managers they just they have these investment funds so you can invest in an investment fund um and normally it's the same who are those who are kind of issuing or those who are then putting them in an, in, in an investment fund and selling them and so there's quite some conflict of interest which i can't go into now but I could do later how JP Morgan is issuing them, is having an index and then actually also selling the bonds, um, the funds in which the bonds are included. Um, but there is no mechanism to find out how to resolve the debt or to cancel the debt. Uh, when, once there are problems to repay those uh, because of there's been huge lobbying going on against any regulation. So we saw with Argentina that these asset managers, so the Black Rocks and others, are really negotiating extremely harsh, so not to so that the can the debt is not being cancelled. Um, and developing countries are paying paying back because they think they will lose their reputation. Um, but that means that a lot of public spending kind of that is needed for basic services, um, for uh, sustainability issues, you know, um, and other kind of services also that women need, basically there will be no funding for it. So that's very problematic. So there are lots of problems, but I hope this gives you some examples how the mechanism is working, how the financial sector is indeed intermediaries and are facilitating this system um, to kind of extract the money from the corporations, from societies, um, and even from our governments. So next slide, please. This is a kind of, yeah, it's good to know the examples and to know what the problems are, but we have to get organized and we have to do it now. Um, this was a nice picture from an artist in uh, New York, which I thought was uh, kind of an, a good way um, to think about what, what should we try and argue for solutions. Next slide, please. So systemically there are huge amount of issues it's difficult probably to argue but if you want to have a slogan and if you actually use it already in 2008 there were two of them shrink the financial sector and close the casino um with shrinking the financial sector there are different ways how to do it one which is now actually active because of climate change people start to understand whoa this might also decrease the value and even the central the supervisors are behind it um you know, there are possibilities and there should be much more stricter laws so that whatever is being financed is only for corporate companies or activities or projects or whatever that have social and environmental beneficial impacts. It's not only about the risk to the financial sector, which is for the moment what supervisors are concerned about, but it's about impact. So it means, and there's a need to really kind of um, establish ways to have a human rights impact assessment, a gender perspective, because for the moment the mechanisms are not there. They want to computerize everything because that's more efficient, cheaper. That's not the way to go it. And that's where we really have to hammer out. It's not only about climate change um, just happening out of the blue, but it is also very much interlinked with human rights, certainly also with um, a gender perspective. Of course, the other way to shrink the, se the sector is to really limit the size of the banks. The too we still have too big to fail banks, but also these manager, uh, asset managers, the Black Rocks and others, because the central bank had to intervene to save the, um, the financial markets from turmoil, and they were at once. Um, and also the stock exchanges just kind of going and growing and as much as they can. Um, but also, I think the the corporate decision making has also to change so that it's not a shareholder value, um, but it's very much the impact they have, the preference and the priority to workers' benefits in all kinds of sense and ways, as well as consumer society and planet. And the second one is like the close the casino. I mean, for the moment, hedge funds, for instance, are betting against 
what I saw the travel business, the shares of the travel businesses, they were able to get up till now one billion of profits. The same when the lower, when the prices of oil are lowering, it called, it's called shorting, they are able to get 50 million just in one week. So, I mean, there's lots of socially useless speculation that needs to be stopped. Um, and, you know, it's quite well known who it is, you know, where they are. Um, and, you know, this high frequency trading, for instance, I mean, it's absolutely useless. The nanoseconds to, to do trading to get a bit of profit. Uh, the second one is, yes, there should be extra profits. The extra profits that are being paid out for the moment should really be taxed. Uh, there are some examples of Barona wealth tax, whatever you can call it. Um, but there's no way that, you know, dividends and sharebacks uh, should continue. And I think also the central banks have to stop uh, this kind of bailout, this QE, quantitative easing, which is actually bailing out the financial markets rather than making the financial markets pay for what they were able to gain. So my final slide, please. Um, is kind of more, pro probably more practical ones. Um, I mean, for developing countries, the debt burden, uh, you know, they were lured into kind of commercial debt and there is no solution for the moment on what to do about it. Um, there are different ways to go about it. When I'm saying more transparency for, of who is holding those debts, uh, for the moment, you only can find it through databases, is because we want, for instance, to say no way that we have... Um, by those buying bonds being based in tax havens, for instance. Uh, supervisors have to say this debt was uh, undue, was because a lot of risk was taken, you knew about it, it was very clear, it was very risky, that's why you have these high interest rates, so you have to restructure and you have to cancel, um, and you have the means to do so. I mean, it's very these kind of asset managers are rich enough to kind of get cancelled at that. Um, and there are, for the moment, in different countries, sustainability finance laws. Um, and this should also include that there should be no irresponsible kind of um, issuing of bonds, uh, buying of bonds, selling of bonds, etc. And of, another one is a um, solution, a practical solution, is that governments and central banks especially should be able to manage the capital that is flowing in and out so that it's not for speculation. And of course, yeah, the real, real problem is this kind of shareholder ext extractivism. Um, and that needs that will need much more regulation and enforcement. There are different ways to do so. Um, but at least, I mean, at least we should say no share buybacks anymore, whenever. Because now for the moment they continue. Um, and there should also no be dividends being paid uh, if workers and jobs, if their pay, if their conditions are not being improved. Um, and also that also absolutely means that, you know, the gender and the social assessment of all financing needs to be developed urgently. And it's not that they can't do it, they just don't want to make the cost for it. Um, and it's going to be complex, and that's what we all have to be involved in. And of course, thirdly, and also as always, regulatory capture, the financial lobby is stopping whatever regulation is coming up to improve or at least to start and limit to a certain extent the financial sector. And you, you really have to expose it. So that's why I was, I was asking also to Saskia, what are the names of those companies who are doing it? Uh, the ones you mentioned, for instance, one of them is a big one is Blackstone. Um, it's a hedge fund based in a, in a tax haven. So, but they are lobbying against all these rules. BlackRock is doing the same everywhere. We are in Europe, we're taking action to uh, expose that they are even advising the European Commission how the banks should be regulated. Uh, but they're doing that everywhere. They're investing in, in their campaigns against it, against BlackRock, because they invest so much in extractives and fossil fuels. So there are lots of things and issues to be done, but we have to link the bashing of the companies who are uh, very much involved and facilitate this extractivism with regulations, demand for regulations um, very urgently because those two communities not always come together. And as SOMO, we are trying to, to bring them more together through research, but also helping them to find out you know, where the regulation is being uh, happening. So if there is, um, that's where I want to end. Um, my next slide is just providing some links for next reading. And I hope we will have an interesting discussion. I leave it um, up to here. Thank you so much, Miriam. This was amazing. And you are giving us a lot of tasks uh, to work on <laughs> our future activism. Uh, we will do it with you for sure. 
We are sharing the links that you share with us with the audience right now. And um, I'm gonna move on with these uh, points of entry that you gave us about uh, not necessarily investing, but extracting. And how is that having also an impact in environment? So for this um, element, we will invite uh, our beloved and admired Joe Kling, who is um, the, um, well, he, she's an, the director of uh, Third World Network, as you all know, and she's also an international lawyer whose areas of expertise include the environmental, social, and economic impacts of globalization, especially in the Global South. And uh, since 1993, she has worked closely with the key negotiators from Global South, scientists and NGOs, to campaign for biosafety and climate justice. Her current focus areas are climate change, the interface between biodiversity and traditional knowledge, as well as intellectual property rights, the relationship between multilateral environmental agreements and trade agreements, environmentally sound technology transfer and developments of these issues at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biodiver Biological Diversity, the World Trade Organization, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, so, uh, my dear Jogling, the floor is yours, and we are so uh, happy to have you here, and we are so willing to, to be wowed by your wisdom and knowledge. So, welcome. Can we unmute uh, Jogling? Sorry. Thank you. That was a scary uh, introduction. Uh, thank you again to uh, to you and Rosa for doing this amazing series. And it's such a privilege to be with uh, Miriam and Saskia and Zoe, who's coming up later. Um, at the beginning of this discussion, um, uh, Saskia had said there are many negatives which are often dressed as the solutions of brilliant minds. Uh, and that's a brilliant way of summing it. And what I'm going to talk about uh, here flows from what Miriam also was talking about, the false solutions, you know, the same old thing, the same old wine, which has gone sour and bad, being sort of repackaged in very glossy uh, bottles, yeah? So, um, so what I want to zero in tonight on, because these are two issues, two concepts that are now very, very um, hot as the center of the agenda, both in the climate change negotiations, uh, which is the net zero concept, uh, and also in the biodiversity uh, post-2020 new framework for, for biodiversity conservation and sustainable use, uh, which was supposed to be launched this year, but because of COVID, you know, all these things have been postponed. And I think the postponement because of COVID is giving us some time to actually try and get our own act together. So net zero and nature-based solutions are really very much centered around uh, uh, the sort of solution to climate change. And it is also a way of uh, capturing the biodiversity, you know, knowledge, uh, rights of communities, indigenous peoples, which is central to our Convention on Biological Diversity. That whole uh, 20, 25 years of, of programs and commitments and work is being actually captured uh, by the intermediaries, as we were talking about, you know, who are trying to really financialize uh, nature, run away from being the things that we need to do to change the way we consume, to change the way we produce, and to change the inequality of power relations and distribution, and calling it net zero. And I'm just going to quickly run through some of these slides. Next, please. So the net zero concept is now being thrown into the climate change negotiations as a new long term climate goal. It was if you remember the, the, the climate change convention, the treaty, the mother treaty, the UN, UNFCCC talked about stabilizing the atmosphere, talk about reducing emissions uh, for the country from the countries that were highly industrialized, had used up their share of the carbon space, and they have to really push back and change and transform production and consumption. And for the South, not to follow the same climate destructive fossil based, uh, fuel based uh, development model and to go to sustainability. That was the compact in 1994, right? 1992, rather. So all that's been turned around because the, the, the power, in, uh, the powerful in the unequal world do not want to change the way they operate. The fossil fuel industry does not want to change the fossil fuel being the basis of wealth. So there is a global push now to throw in this thing called net zero climate targets. And many governments and corporations are declaring that they have these goals as well. 
And the UK, the UK, which is supposed to be hosting the next conference of the parties, the COP26, which has been postponed also to next year, is taking on this whole net zero target. Now, what is it? This is actually, uh, you know, it's this very simplistic and wrong portrayal to say if we are emitting and releasing carbon dioxide and have been for hundreds of years into the atmosphere, then we should also now capture or sequester it back. And it will be net zero if we release 10 tons, we capture back 10 tons by having huge plantations, uh, all kinds of technological fix it, and then we'll come to net zero. But actually, this is very dangerous because the term is being used to actually run away, it's an escape clause, to evade historical responsibility, is to evade the burden sharing based on equity so that the rich in the north and the rich within the south also have to do their share. It disguises climate inaction for 20, 30 years. Nothing has changed. Fossil fuel continues. Industrialization continues. In fact, a lot of the expansion of the uh, uh, in, uh, AI and the new gig economy is very energy intensive. Running super duper computers uses a lot of energy. It's a climate hazard. But all this is being portrayed as very clean technology. So basically, what we are very worried about is net zero can be used to justify scaling up infra extraction and more burning of fossil fuels. Next, please. The next slide, please. Yeah. So it is greenwashing. More and more, the climate justice groups, the women's groups who are in the climate, uh, you know, action uh, uh, kind of processes, those fighting for equity and also high ambitious uh, actions in climate. We are now deconstructing what this means. Okay. This is really a dubious way of accounting. Remember, about ten years ago, this whole thing about carbon trading was a big deal. All right. The European Union, especially, had created the carbon market, and this is really introducing a whole new lot of intermediaries. Uh, so it's Instead of controlling my pollution, changing my uh, consumption and production uh, system in, in the north, we actually say, the poor countries, you're not polluting as much, I'll buy your carbon space. So we'll trade. This kind of trading schemes have actually created a new bubble of financialization and it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked to push back on climate change and it has actually created new financial instabilities. And so what we find now, the terms carbon trading is not used so much because it's been discredited. A lot of it has to do with the activism of civil society and women's groups really have been at the forefront of this as well. But what is happening now is this net uh, zero concept is actually another way of doing carbon shifting. Next, please. The next slide, please. Yeah. So is there a legal basis? No, there's nothing in the UNFCCC, our mother climate convention, neither is there in the Paris Agreement the term z net zero. There was a huge debate and fight over the concept of sinks. And a lot of us in the civil society uh, movement, and especially indigenous peoples and the communities, did not want their lands and their forests to be treated just as a carbon sink. But the concept of, yes, of course, by nature, you, you emit carbon. You, nature also has its way of absorbing. But this term of net zero, which means that you can you know, absorb and capture as much as you admit, it's not a concept because scientifically it's not, you know, not valid and there's legally no such concept. But what it really means is that we use our land and we use ecosystem approaches. We use forests, grasslands, wetlands to absorb carbon and we then plant lots and lots of trees, plantations, monocultures. This is the fight, how dangerous that could be. And then we find that the, the biodiversity convention that talks about conservation of biodiversity that recognize monoculture as actually very bad and also the impact on people who live on those lands in the forest. How do you, the complexity of all those, those tensions and conflicts and how do we actually uh, give them some kind of equality within the convention on biological diversity is actually being undermined because in the climate debate is treating all of biodiversity as basically a sink. So this is actually a very uh, dangerous uh, trend. And what is very, very uh, uh, scary is that this zero net zero discussion does not differentiate between two types of carbon. There's a the fossil carbon that you release from burning fuel, and then there's land-based carbon in cycles of agriculture and human use. And they're very, very, very different. Okay, next please. So basically, what when we reduce 
the whole climate uh, action into really how to uh, you know find ways technologically or through nature to uh, absorb what we have continuously and increasingly uh, you know emit in, through our unchanged industrial and consumption patterns into the atmosphere if we keep that business as usual then what happens is that crazy ideas like geoengineering building up shields in the in outer space or having huge uh, you know projects that will actually capture and remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as if you're cleaning up a dirt floor. All these actually are technological solutions, which are, again, another round of environmental hazards, don't work, are very, very costly. And we find already a lot of experiments are going on. And a lot of public money is used to be uh, subsidizing this kind of uh, crazy solutions, which are non-solutions. Next, please. So the Paris Agreement, again, now opens the door for another round of global carbon market. So you find Japan, New Zealand, Norway, and Switzerland have actually set in their national action plans to the year 2030 that they will rely on carbon markets and offsets, right? So in other words, we won't change the way we do business, but we will then look at other countries in the world and we will then zero off and offset uh, our pollution against your absorbing my problem. Next, please. And then tied to this uh, uh, net zero concept is now you will find, and I'm sure many of you are seeing this term nature-based solutions coming up all over the place. It's come up in the UN summit on climate change. It's coming up on the, at the end of this month in the biodiversity summit in the UN in New York. You see it in the climate change discussions and negotiations, and you see it in the post-2020 biodiversity framework. The term nature-based solutions actually first came up uh, from the IUCN uh, in 2016 when they introduced this idea of nature-based solutions as actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that also deal with society challenges, et cetera, et cetera. So this actually, if you look at the seven you know, societal challenges, marries humanity with human beings, uh, ecosystems, which sounds really quite you know, reasonable, and I don't think we can argue uh, with the concept and the elements. Next, please. Next, yeah. But what happens, right? Although uh, nature-based solutions, you know, as a concept sounds perfectly logical, makes sense, we could address climate change in countries, we should encourage the ecosystems approach, adaptation, conservation, etc. However, the way it has been reduced to be just sinks and removals in the south for the carbon emissions of the north, this is very dangerous. And this means that we will actually have business as usual. Indigenous peoples and communities dependent on the forest and agriculture are going to be marginalized and more exploited, and women will be even worse exploited in that scenario, and climate change will worsen. Next. So as I said, in the climate change, uh, climate summit uh, last year, nature-based solutions for climate coalition was formed, and it's even a manifesto, and it's a private public partnership. Companies, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, declaring they will have these net zero goals. Uh, 196 projects were registered, and it takes away from the fundamental, you know, policy, law, inequities that we have to uh, deal with. All the things we talked about in the last 30 minutes. This is all about voluntarism, and it's about the role of the private sector, and the global compact is very central in this and of course some of the huge uh, uh, environmental organizations are key players next please and at the end of the month this month on the 30th of september we will have the un summit on biodiversity and this is going to look at the restoration of biodiversity and implementation of nature-based solutions and we see this again and it talks about how these solutions can provide a proven vehicle for harnessing financial support for biodiversity there's no funding for biodiversity most of the money for biodiversity has come from public money at especially in developing countries. And yet here you see the words in UN documents talking about how nature-based solutions provide a proven vehicle for harnessing financial support. From what Miriam and Saskia have just told us, you know, there is no such thing. In fact, it's very extractive. It is not about harnessing. Next, please. So the Biodiversity Convention uh, Conference of the Parties is now you know, supposed to be held this year in October, it has been postponed to next year. And there you will find again splattered across the uh, documents how the link now is biodiversity being used to actually deal with climate change of course there's a correlation nobody's denying that but it is reducing is the reductionism of the complexity of biodiversity and humanity's uh, relationship into now turning us into sinks into climate change mitigation adaptation etc again nature-based solutions we see that as a target next please 
the, uh, the, the CBD, the Biodiversity Convention, has an expert panel on biodiversity financing, and they've been working on this mobilizing financial resources for biodiversity conservation and sustainable use for many, many years. The latest report, and these are a couple of quotes I, I pulled out, because they are talking about how government, civil society, and development banks should help to create opportunities for investment the language of investment in conservation, etc., in order to develop a pipeline of sound business opportunities with good risk return profiles, as well as opportunities for impacting investing. Remember what Miriam just told us, it's not about risk, it's about impact, impact that's good, impact that's bad, you want to avoid, but it's back to the same old, same old. So we see financial language just coming, coming right in into every aspect uh, because you know why the intermediaries that we are talking about in the financialization are the ones coming in the Goldman Sachs and all these other people they are the experts they are the ones who are coming in and they are sitting there and they are being outsourced to do all these uh, analysis and impacts and they are feeding into the debate of nature and humanity so you look at the other side of the screen and what does this mean it says we can include establishing incubators to innovate and pilot new solutions etc etc green bonds uh, more targeted focus Capital markets, pension funds, let's go get the pension funds, the last public money of our old age, right? And let's put that into these new types of uh, pipeline. This is very, very worrying. And that's the kind of uh, information that developing countries and in the North, our governments, the public you know, servants have to really take these ideas and challenge them and we have to challenge them. Our worry is that with COVID, there will not be face-to-face -face negotiations for all these meetings. That means these crazy ideas and dangerous ideas will systematically be put in there and many of our countries are very busy fighting COVID at the national level and fighting the outfall of COVID. So we won't have time to be tracking all this. So that is a challenge for us as civil society and women's organizations, especially to really uh, track this and to be able to have a response together. Next, please. Right, and the, uh, the UK it will be the presidency for the climate uh, convention. Again, uh, maximizing linkages between the two agendas, biodiversity and climate, nature-based uh, solutions is there again uh, for finance. Next, please. Yeah, most at the end. Yeah, quickly, myths and realities. So like I said at the beginning, there is a huge difference between fossil carbon that come from burning of fossil fuels and land-based carbon. If we treat the two as the same, then we will just be putting a green wash over the burning of fossil fuels, which is the biggest problem for emissions, and nothing is going to be changed there. And at the same time, we shift attention to say, how are we going to turn nature into a carbon sink and attack agriculture? Agriculture is a problem. And that's why for those of us who are fighting for agroecology, for organic farming, for restoring our, restoring the soils and the waters and the land, we want to be able to turn agriculture to become harmonious to human nature and our future. So we have to fight industrial agriculture, right? So, so by you, lumping everything together not differentiating then we keep pushing the solutions uh, into the hands of the exploited and make them victims again right so fossil carbon will never go back to the ground you cannot recapture those we have to actually keep them in the ground which is a big part of the movement especially in south america and therefore we have to realize that the core of the problem is that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere and there's no such thing as capturing them and having net zero next please and I like, I like this quote from uh, one of the leading uh, expert uh, 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 scientists in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He says, you cannot fit the geosphere, our physical Earth, into the biosphere. And that's what net zero tries to do. We've contaminated the atmosphere. We can capture them back using the planet. And this is not going to happen. So natural climate solutions like forest management do not lessen the need for actually mitigation, prevention from energy and industrial sectors. And that's where we need to pay attention to. Next one. And if we don't do it right, if we seek solutions that we will keep emitting in our lands as the rich, and then we have somebody else in the poor who will then become the forest and the sink, then it is a, another form of colonialism. Okay, this is carbon colonialism. And the solutions of nature-based solutions system, solutions for what, for whom? Who actually created the problem and who is going to be profiting from the solution? Many of those are the intermediaries we were talking about. And this is something that we need to pay attention to because if we don't do decarbonization by attacking industrialization and unsustainable production, then what we are doing is to go back to the South and the poorest in the South, including the women, to create another round of debt. Miriam talked about the financial debt. There is a climate debt owed by the last generations and the rich to the poor. And we cannot be allowing that debt to be shifted right, in the name of nature-based solutions, 
carbon zero, zero net, whatever it is, to the poor again and to nature. Next one, please. Um, and if we go along these four solutions, then we're going to just, you know, like I said, have uh, land grabs, forest grabs, you know, uh, in the name of climate and biodiversity solutions. So this is something that uh, we cannot allow to happen. Next, please. So what do we do? Some of the questions, I'm not giving answers. I think the questions we need to ask ourselves is, we all need to understand better, what are the underlying agendas for those who are promoting net zero, for those who are using the term nature-based solutions, solutions, which actually by itself is not wrong. But when you look behind what is actually being framed as nature-based solutions, it's very dangerous. And we need to actually expose that in those, especially the negotiations. Who is promoting them and why are they promoting them? A lot of it has to do with those intermediaries we've been touching on this evening. Who will benefit? Who will lose? We've been asking those questions the whole night. And what do we need to do to prevent the bad and the negative outcomes, the impact, as Miriam was saying, and how do we advance the positive? These are the questions that have to guide us as we actually move uh, uh, towards uh, fighting for the real solutions. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so, so much, uh, dear Jokling. So many, so many issues. And um, in one of the readings that uh, Marion was sharing with us, she was mentioning how uh, the global banks were releasing um, since 2015 two, two trillions of money to invest in the extraction of fossil fuels, as opposed to all of the financial instruments that are under the UNFCCC platform. So this is very revealing in terms of on, on having clarity on what are our demands and how it, this is linked to the financial and extractive industry. So thank you very much for, for making it so clear for us. And uh, I'm just also going to give the floor now to our uh, respondent, who is a uh, feminist activist. Uh, she's So Ranjamaro. She's an economist development uh, from Development Alternatives Coordinator uh, in the African Women Unite Against Destructive Resource Extraction, Women. She's a longtime feminist researcher and human rights activist from Madagascar, and she's a sociologist by training, working as an expert on the gender dimensions of macroeconomic trade investment and global governance issues for international development organization, including the major UN agencies. And she joined women in March in 2020 with a view to achieve the goal of her lifetime as a professional and activist to contribute to a just transition toward economist, uh, eco-feminist development alternatives in Africa in solidarity with other sisters and allies. So uh, we welcome you. So we would like to uh, ask you, how does this macro debate, and as Saskia was saying, very abstract, but I think uh, all of our panelists have been uh, dealing with in a more material way, but um, we we hope you could also help us see in the material world how all of this conversation is impacting uh, the, the territories on the ground, especially in, in the African region. So we are very privileged to have you and to benefit from your knowledge and wisdom. So please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me right? Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to, to be in the same panel as these very inspiring um, uh, sisters that, uh, that have spoken before me. What I'm going to try is to um, uh, talk to you about how financial extractivism operates uh, in Africa and um, how it is impacting uh, African women and peoples, basically. And I will uh, end up with some uh, proposals and demands for uh, the way towards a more uh, just and um, and uh, alternative economic uh, model. So um, as you certainly know very well, uh, African countries have been subject to financial extractivism for many decades. Uh, and most notably during the structural adjustment era of the 1980s, which was marked by the accumulation of external debt 
but also by an increased exploitation of women by the patriarchal capitalist system. So um, I'm not going to uh, repeat what uh, Saskia has also uh, has already said about um, uh, the African country's debt, which stands at um, about uh, 50, 57 percent of the continent's gross domestic product uh, in 2019. And what is important to know is that uh, most of this external debt is owed to private uh, lenders. So um, many of these African countries have issued uh, the so-called uh, bonds that uh, Saskia talked to us about already. And now they are facing currency speculation and depreciation lower commodity prices, plummeting financial markets, and bond sell-offs due to huge financial outflows by foreign investors. These investors being, of course, uh, mainly from the financial sector. So uh, the COVID, uh, in addition to that, the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered the first recession in sub-Saharan Africa in 25 years, and this is mainly due to the largest ever capital flight and a brisk withdrawal of international investment from uh, African economies. In addition to that, there is the ecological debt that my sister Yokling has uh, very rightly called uh, uh, carbon colonialism. And uh, this ecologi ecological debt is owed to Africa by the G20 and wealthy countries. And it has been built up since colonial times and increasing day by day, especially in terms of carbon debt in the context of climate change. So just to give you uh, an example, uh, can we uh, move the slides, please? Yes, next one. Okay, thanks. So just to give you a concrete example, Africa has just 16% of the world's population and emits just 4% of global carbon emissions. By comparison, the average North American emits 17 times more carbon than the average African. So, in addition to uh, this uh, carbon colonialism, the continent is also a victim of illicit capital outflows with appro approximately $850 billion withdrawn from the continent between 1970 and 2008. The, there is also this... Um, uh, very, um, the, the expertise that, fin that um, financial speculators have in extracting value from anything. So there is also the, the popularization of microfinance schemes with uh, very high interest rates and of which women, women especially the poor women, uh, are the main targets. There is also the financialization of nature that um, the previous speaker just talked about, so I'm not going to, uh, to, to repeat. And um, the financialization of nature and uh, of uh, almost every strategic uh, development sector is greatly facilitated by the free trade and investment agreements, which facilitate um, the takeover by uh, financial speculators 
of the of the the food and um, agricultural sectors in African countries, and this has very grave and uh, critical gender impact. So now what are the, the impacts of uh, this financial extractivism on African women and people? I think um, it has al already been said by the previous speakers, but I think it is important to, to, um, to recognize that the issue of debt, especially in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, is a typical example of uh, socialization of the economic cost of financial extractivism. As I mentioned earlier, 32% of the external debt of African governments is owed to private lenders, and 55% of external interest payments are to private creditors. So I, I, I have um, seen recently in a, in a report by a financial newspaper that uh, the president of Senegal uh, complains that African nations are being ripped off by Wall Street. And um, that is actually the sad reality because um, the borrowing cost of African countries for 10 years are between 5% and 10%, which is well above uh, other emerging markets. Other countries uh, in, uh, in other developing or emerging um, countries do not pay uh, do not pay as, uh, as much as African countries. So the private creditors have made exceptional profits, um, estimated between 300% uh, and 2,000% through the repurchase at a low price of the bonds of 15 African governments. So, Again, it is important to remember that for some African countries, debt servicing represents more than 25% of their revenues, and most countries spend less on health than on debt service, which sits in the region of 10 and 13% of their national budgets. And this high debt servicing is paid mainly to private investors and investment funds from the public budget, which means that um, the many economic, social, and environmental needs of the African peoples uh, may not be met because uh, the, the public money is going to pay for the uh, debt servicing to the financial as speculators. Um, it is also important to mention another way through which uh, financial extractivism operates in Africa, which is through the, um, the macroeconomic conditionalities attached to the loans by the international financial institutions which have imposed austerity and fiscal discipline measures that are very harmful to women and to essential social services, and which are also locking in liberalization and privatization policies with that further increased financialization. In addition to that, the ecological and social cost of financial extractivism are externalized onto women in affected communities. And this is because the dominant gender division of labor assigns primary responsibility to women uh, for the production, the processing, and the preparation of food, as well as the provisioning of water and fuel, and the care of household members. And because of these roles, African working class and rural women deeply depend on natural resources and a healthy environment. 
Consequently, whenever there is a destructive environmental fallout as a result of extractivist projects financed by speculative capital, the negative impacts fall most heavily on women and increase their unpaid care work. So the financialization of a global food system and agricultural supply chains that, uh, that has been established by transnational corporation has meant that the impacts of supply and demand movement in food commodities have exacerbated gender inequalities in access to food together with rural women's multiple disadvantages in the African agricultural production and food systems. So what are the demands of, um, of African um, uh, ecofeminist activists? From an ecofeminist perspective, we believe that the dismantling, can we move the slide please to the last one? So we believe that the dismantling of the current global financial system is the starting point for a radical shift away from the dominant extractivist patriarchal system towards democratically organized, life-sustaining and resilient economic systems. The just transition to alternative economic models, according to us, involves a wide range of requirements, starting from debt cancellation, based on the recognition of the ecological debt owed to African countries, the elimination of illicit financial flows from the continent, the establishment of capital controls by African uh, central banks and governments, the end of tax havens, tax holidays and bailout packages for corporations, as well as the establishment of global taxation for ecologically harmful industries to also moving towards the nationalization of all privatized essential public services. We should not be uh, dependent on speculative capital to be able to enjoy essential public services. We also believe that it is critically important to support African women's long-time resistance against the capitalist and patriarchal extractivist development model, which is grounded in the domination of the nature and women's subordination. It is necessary to forge international solidarity and alliances between feminist activists in the global north and African women in communities who defend their land, water, homes, and their very right to exist, as well as their interdependent relationship with nature, without which we would not survive. We believe that this is the only way to build social movements that can generate the political pressure for ensuring deeper structural change and effective regulation of the global financial system in the public interest and not only in the interest of the financial sector. Uh, thank you for listening to me. And I'm quite, I'd be quite happy to respond to any question you might have. Thank you so, so much. So um, we are uh, a bit of our, above our time, but this has been a very rich conversation and we definitely don't want to miss the, any detail of it. I'm going to invite our other uh, colleagues who have been speakers in this, in this amazing, uh, very inspiring webinar. And just to pose to you uh, a round of uh, comments and questions. So, and you feel free to address uh, what you feel that you would like to talk the most. 
There are some questions about, I think there is a lot of uh, interest about how civil society uh, can engage in these type of topics, how they can, on one hand, grasp more of, of these type of conversations, and on the other, what, what can they do and how they can engage in, in advocacy. There is also, I think, a, a, um, a concern about how to translate this type of scientific and technical knowledge to, to grassroots. And uh, there are also interests um, on, the, um, on the regulation versus operation. I mean, whether the regulation is enough, I think we have heard uh, that uh, there are always ways to to not put into operation what has been uh, already regulated. And on the other side, as Jocelyn was posing, there, the language in the so-called regulation is so tricky that in the end it allows for, for more uh, extractive um, uh, action. So um, there is also a question on, on green bones uh, and the, towards the green recovery. So um, how can regulation really uh, help us shape the, the type of, of recovery we would like? Um, feel free to, to respond on, on any of these fields as, as you feel um, uh, comfortable with. And let, let's make a round before we, we wrap up this webinar. So um, who would like to, to go first? Shall I? Miriam, first, <laughs> I'll try yeah. to go first and then others can join. Um, of course, I mean, there's it, it is absolutely a challenge on kind of trying to translate it. Um, and I always say, you know, we need different kind of groups. Um, some of us, like me, you know, try and really to find out what it is. And I, I always call myself Alice in Wonderland. Um, but also, I mean, it, it is possible to have uh, simple mes messages. I think if we continue to call, you know, financial extractivism, you know, the financial sector is extractive, an extractive industry, um, you know, there is responsibility that also need to be shared by the financial sector and not as now to do so, um, you know, and also, so that's kind of one. The easy actions also is um, to uh, shame and name kind of that people that these kind of companies know, even if, you know, it's not clear for everybody, but I think that's quite important uh, that they don't remain um, so kind of anonymous because I was a bit, yeah, Saskia, for instance, didn't name them, but I think it's it, that is important also to do and it's not so difficult because there are battles going on in cities against those um, investment funds and intermediaries for the moment. Um, and I think so, but, and also just to ask for regulation, of course, there are always loopholes, but it's also to, ex to show why, um, gov I mean, what I see is that governments and regulators that are the parliamentarians who have the law, the supervisors, the central bankers, they didn't kind of dare to go against the interest of the financial sector. And just, we have to build up that pressure to say, yes, regulation can help because that's how you change also certain systems of course basically you want to start the whole thing up anew um, and we have to continue to ask for radical changes and at the same time use moments of regulation um, and pressure on the um, I mean our governments in the in the democratic space to say that you know public interest is first because even parliamentarians who are kind of setting the regulations uh, for the financial sector I have no clue, actually. They listen to the lobbies. Um, so exposing these lobbies, putting the pressure is important. And that can be done with simple messages. And some of us will, you know, kind of bashing outside and some of us will then go inside. This means this and this and this um, and so on. But yes, we have to continue to be practical, but at the same time, do the demands in simple terms for radical change. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, yeah, um, yeah I'll just uh, follow up from where Miriam went. I think there was also a question again about how to transmit this kind of information to the grassroots groups. I think, you know, as Miriam said, you know, I think the it's not a question of some people are expert and others are not. I think it's all about knowledge. It's about information. I think a lot of the time, um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, all these uh, 
you know, the, the banks and these institutions we talk about, uh, they actually mystify so that uh, regulators and parliamentarians don't know what's happening. So many of the time, you know, of course there's corruption and all that kind of stuff, but a majority of the time, you know, when we talk to civil servants or parliamentarians or even politicians, they're just ignorant, right? So basically it's the layers, I think, as civil society groups, we our job is to investigate, to learn and to strip and to expose and then we make our demands. And I think that's not something new. We've done it on so many things from, from the local level uh, to the national and to the global. I think what is very powerful for us to, because the more, more things are globalized in the sense that decisions are taken further and further away from our community, from our country, then we have to engage. And this is what I think this webinar series is also really emphasizing. A lot of the groups who are around here sharing through this whole period in so many different webinars and COVID in a way is bringing us closer <laughs> because it used to be we would hold a meeting for maybe 30, 40 people. It's expensive. You fly all over the place. Now we are talking to people all over the world at different time zones um, and we are actually sharing a lot. Yeah. So I think it's about each of us know something the others do not know and we're all learning. So I think if we feel, if we don't feel that we are, uh, can't understand, that's the first step. There's nothing. All of us are experts and all of us are also humbled. And I think that sharing, how we share, uh, I think is really important. As Miriam said, some of us are digging around, doing the research, uh, you know, and also like engaging with the UN system or, or going to talk with, to your local government. We all know how to do it at different levels. It's not that different. It's about the level of knowledge and how do we share that knowledge. And I think we need to organize ourselves better that way. And I just want to quickly end by also saying, you know, what COVID has done, and listening to what Zoe was talking about, about Africa, you know, this, this, this huge leap, I mean, this private debt has been building up for a long time. And for Asia, many Asian countries have a very hybrid where the state plays a very big role in, uh, you know, government enterprises, uh, you know, the market, but also the state plays a very big role. We have public health systems, education systems, but we were also privatizing, but maybe not as much. So in the crisis like the pandemic now, we can see where public systems still are intact, there's a better response. Uh, the richest countries have been so fragmented. I mean, you know, in the UK, they privatize contact tracing to Deloitte. Talk about intermediary. What does Deloitte know about, you know, contact <laughs> tracing and public health? And of course, what Deloitte did was it took a big chunk of money from the taxpayer and then it hired another maybe eight or nine companies, another subcontract level. If that's not financialization of health, I don't know what is. OK, and this whole bunch of three or four, you know, uh, drug companies without selling with there's no effective vaccine, nowhere near. But look at the shares, they've gone up, they made so much money. Some people have become very, very rich in this pandemic and entire countries are going bankrupt. And our governments have to deal in the end with people who are sick, who are dying, who have no jobs. And I think this is the moment. It is the time for us to reclaim our public space. So our politicians know that all the capital flight means who in the end is going to be there to clean up. It's us, the people. It's our money, right? And I think this is where we have to, you know, like really grab the opportunity because the other side also comes in and tries to steal more. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, dear Jo Kling. Um, so do you want to take the floor? Yes. Um, only to agree with my uh, with my two sisters. Uh, I think we need to, um, there has to be some kind of uh, division of labor within uh, civil society and activists, you know, uh, so that some of us do the research, do the, you know, the technical stuff, and others try to translate this into simple, um, simple uh, ideas uh, and, uh, and words that um, people uh, at the community level can, uh, can understand so that um, there, there can um, be uh, social movements. You know, we are asking for change, but uh, social movements are making the change. So we cannot escape from movement building and from this uh, international solidarity and strategic alliances I was calling for at the end of my presentation.
Well, thank you so much. I mean, I feel like there are so many things we want to talk about. We see the enthusiasm and interest of the of the audience. Uh, they men, many have said how inspired they feel. We feel the same. We are thinking that uh, the richness of these conversations is going to be um, uh, tried to to summarize and synthesize. We will share that uh, in in due time with all of you. And we are, as I mentioned to Saskia, we are thinking on on a future conversation on how to translate all of these um, these uh, challenges into into possible points of entry for our activism and to strategize a bit more uh, besides the analysis, how we can really find the, the, the more powerful points of entry. All of you have emphasized that this is the time to act and uh, have given many proposals. So we will reach out to you as women's working group on, on that um, on that, and we thank you, uh, our audience, in in staying here uh, a bit late but listening to these uh, remarkable speakers. I'm going to invite my colleague uh, Rosa to to say goodbye, and um, hopefully we, you we will you will join us in our next webinar in October on digitalization of economy, which is the, the final and closing webinar for, for this series. I think uh, Rosa is there. Yeah. I'm here. <laughs> I want to join Emilia in thanking Jocelyn, Miriam, Zoe, um, Saskia, and our partners, um, Woman, Third World Network, um, SOMO, all of you who have joined us in viewing this, thank you so much. Um, we're so grateful, as Emilia said, we want to continue uh, to have you as part of this work, as part of this network for macro solutions for women, people on the planet. I just want to say thank you, goodbye, stay safe, stay healthy, and mobilize. Thank you so much. Ciao, thank you.